well known upon instability due to multiple mutations which are around 130 in transthyretin it dissociates and misfold aggregate into long fibril structure and upon fibrillation it starts depositing in various organs especially heart and and this has given you know the, the most popular molecule which professor uh, and dr ravi will talk uh, so the, the the kinetic stabilizers of you know uh, this tetramer are currently in clinical trials and one of them is in clinics right now that is tefamidis so essentially it slows down the progression of aggregation of this protein and uh, on a similar line our lab uh, currently and others in the world they have working on the same kind of a, a you know case scenario this is the protein of huntington which is which expands its polyglutamine and upon expansion of polyglutamine it, it aggregates and we have understood that how it does so there is a nucleation pathway non nucleated pathway but it correlates its aggregation correlates very well with the age of onset and early age of onset upon increasing the aggregation rate and uh, you know length of polyglutamine so this has given us and others a lot of molecules of importance uh, you know we have peptide inhibitors we have small molecular inhibitors essentially they bind to you know different steps of the protein aggregation pathway and we have one or two peptides which completely shuts down the aggregation of polyglutamine even when it, it expands beyond 50 glutamine and we are developing the therapeutic strategies to send these peptides to brain by using nanoparticle approach so apart from mechanism based approaches now in amyloid diseases in general there are a lot of therapeutic interventions that are going on a lot of clinical trials are going on uh, there are around 10 centers in the world which are working very actively to bring medicines to to the clinics for almost many amyloid diseases and uh, there is a lot of development which are which are happening in the field for imaging a particular amyloid or even the small aggregates which probably will will help in finding you know the amyloids very early uh, during the development phase and scientists are working on uh, developing various animal models for transthyretin related amyloidosis so we have you know drosophila model p elegant model cells model rodents model and even monkey models to study uh, heart amyloid now this is only possible because in the world you know a lot of research diagnosis and treat treatments centers are being so i have listed a couple of them or should i say all of them here uh, in developed nations and uh, there is a effort from scientists clinicians and uh, uh, the, the patients together in bringing all those discoveries uh, to, to the clinical side and i would like therefore to bring a point here that in india we need a strong search for amyloidosis in our patients and the reasons i have cited here many of you will be known to it in india although amyloids are appreciated in even 1980s or even before that but still we see scattered and less numbers are reported comprehensive and advanced diagnosis is not done and reported more than 130 mutation in transthyretin itself which makes this protein highly unstable and uh, will make it fibrous is, is not known and we are also aware that we have increasing burden of kidney heart and neurological diseases in india chronic inflammatory conditions like tb ra leprosy has a strong linkage for secondary uh, amyloidosis so to me this whole case scenario makes a very strong case for indian clinicians that we must you know start diagnosing the the, the, the patients for amyloidosis and therefore we need collaborations from clinicians scientists and we pitch at least i am i am pitching my words to you know various journals editors we have whatsapp group with clinicians and funding agencies so that we can move ahead in uh, researching you know amyloids in indian patients so with this uh, we have made some progress this is a uh, you know editorial which was written by me to professor westermark uh, who is a very you know authority in in, in this uh, area of amyloids who discovered basically transthyretin amyloidosis and uh, you know amylin as a diabetes 2 causing agent uh, we also know that it, it is currently known that transmission of amyloid can also happen from animals to to to, to you know other animals uh, there are although very limited uh, reports but in the cellular system in the, in the in the mice 
people have really shown that you know they can transfer so therefore in that case scenario we are also sensitizing uh, veterinarians to start diagnosing uh, you know animals for amyloid amyloid presence and uh, from our side we have made a amyloid club of india where we have you know done a winter workshop uh, in iit kanpur and i am very happy to show this slide that i have reached out in 2019 and 20 and we have a initial interest group where professor talwar is one of them and they have encouraged us a lot about you know taking this uh, as a challenge and start working very actively on this and we have also written a proposal to pfizer although it was not funded uh, we will make more attempts to get funding going and uh, together we have also written a, an editorial in current science to you know again diagnose the cardiac patients and these are some of the outcomes uh, in iit kanpur we have screened one patient uh, who is having wild type transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis although he is just 30 years old and it is wild type transthyretin so that was amazing to see and many more uh, which we are currently working on so the amyloid field i will summarize it that it is a 400 years old field when clinicians used to talk about large dcs liver or you know sago spleen but it has gone now currently to these beautiful structures where we have state of the art technology even in india we can go ahead and you know, try to solve these structures of indian variants of amyloids and understand that how we can target these amyloid fibrils by looking at the three dimensional structure which is solved at the atomic level I, i will just quickly give you one example of this disease type there is one vascular aa and and you know glomerular aa amyloidosis these two pictures are different in terms of electrostatics suggesting that they have different kind of pathology so with this i will skip these slides although these were very important and uh, i would like to thank uh, you know organizers uh, and my clinical collaborators for giving me this opportunity to come over thank you very much thank you that was a very good overview and the potential therapeutic strategies but uh, to look at the prevalence of uh, uh, mutations in attr or attr mutations we have around 10000 human uh, indian genomes that have been sequenced so that is one option that you can go through and map that data and that might give you the prevalence in different parts of the country yes so we have been thinking that is that an igib you can collaborate and that sure, is sure. possible so i think uh, totally shantri sir yeah. sure that will be Thank you. That was you. nice. I think we are short of time, Thank so you. we'll go on to the next talk. Thank you. So uh, I would like to invite Dr. Sudhir Arva, Professor, Department of Pathology, AIMS, New Delhi, for his talk on approach to diagnosing amyloidosis. good afternoon everybody for the first outset i would like to congratulate all the organizing committee to giving me the opportunity to talk about the amyloidosis and also thank dr ashwini so he gave the overview of amyloidosis so today i'll tell you how to diagnose amyloidosis how to subtype amyloidosis when we suspect any cardiac amyloidosis this almost it has been streamlined at all indians of medical sciences with the help of dr sandeep singh so if you see the definition of cardiac amyloidosis it is a deposition of insoluble protein in the heart myocardium which ultimately leads to some kind of a heart dysfunction <coughs> and heart failure sometimes that so the clinical signs and symptoms may depend depends on which organ it is primarily depositing it can be a heart or it can be any other systemic organs in the body so most of the times because we are all cardiologists i am interested in cardiac pathology what we are dealing here what i am going to concentrate here is when we have a patient of clinically suspected cardiac amyloidosis without any other symptom the first time he is coming to the cardiology opd how to go about and see so then what is the incidence of this cardiac amyloidosis world literature says that incidence it is a rare disease but in india we don't know exactly maybe because 
We are not suspecting at the right time. We are not evaluating the patients or we are not, even if we are identifying, we are not typing the amyloid and we are not documenting it. So when should you suspect cardiac amyloidosis? Whenever a cardiologist faces any patient, elderly patient with a heart failure, who is having rhythmic abnormality, heart blocks, AV conduction delays, tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, fibrillation. Whenever you see any patient with this kind of clinical symptoms, always keep in mind that I might be dealing with cardiac amyloidosis. So what? The next easy step, what we follow at AIMS and it has been streamlined here is, first step is to do a non-invasive test, that is ECG. So ECG is the first mode of investigation because it is easily available, but the ECG abnormalities is most commonly, more than 90% of the patient of cardiac amyloidosis do some kind of abnormality, like low voltage QRS complexes, arrhythmias, heart block, and sometimes pseudo-infarct pattern. So it gives uh, you to think about, I'm dealing with cardiac amyloidosis. But these are all not always diagnosed. So next thing is to carry out echocardiographic imaging. So in echocardiography, uh, if you're thinking of any kind of infiltrative cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, with sparkling appearance, with non uh, sparkling appearance of interventricular septum like this, unexplained thickness in the left ventricular wall of more than 12 millimeter with diastolic dysfunction, interatrial septal thickening, and whenever you suspect, it again gives more confirmation that I am dealing with cardiac amyloidosis. The next step is the cardiac magnetic resonance. So cardiac MRI, it is very good, and some people claim that the cardiac MRI images, they are the diagnostic feature for cardiac amyloidosis. I also agree this because in our institute, whenever the cardiac imaging is done by a specialized cardiac radiologist, whenever they say amyloid, we have found amyloid in this patient on endomyocardial biopsy sample. Because Cardiac MRI is a very good, excellent, gives excellent spatial resolution between cardiac myocardium and interstitial place. The interstitial mother is widening, and because of T1, T2 images, and also with the help of late gadolinium enhancement, enhancement, the pattern of advancement, the diffuse subendocardial pattern with involvement of myocardium, with typical nulling pattern, they see the appearance and they say that it is a cardiac amyloidosis. Most of the time, 90, more than 95% of the times, we have seen uh, amyloid deposition on biopsy. So this is the next mode of uh, non-invasive test. Next is, again, one more uh, thing is a PUIP scan. PUIP scan, usually we don't do in all the patients clinically suspected of cardiac amyloidosis, but here what they do, they do technician 99 scan, and I don't know why it has this radial isolable substance. Uh, pyrophosphate, it has some affinity for bones. At the same time, it has uh, same affinity for transparatin type of an amyloid. So here, they have a typical grading. They do it, grade zero, one, two, three. So grade zero means no uptake. Grade one is minimal uptake. Grade two and grade three, it is uptake. It is actually, the uptake is equivalent to the rib or more than a rib. So they will compare with the rib. So, when you see the US data and the approach to cardiac amyloidosis, whenever they say pyrophosphate, PYP scan of grade two and grade three, whether you need biopsy or not, they'll go ahead for treatment for transferatin type of an amyloid. But it has, this kind of PYP scan is interpreted by uh, some of the specialized uh, radiologists and nuclear imaging person who is experienced in this PYP scan. But what, whether, what is our experience in this? We have seen many patients who have been diagnosed as grade two or grade three POP scan, but the same scan when they are evaluated at games, they said it is not grade two. So a lot of inter-observer variability, and even in many of these patients, when the biopsy has been done, we could not even demonstrate this amyloid in the endomyocardial biopsy. Along with that, so diagnosis, the grading is challenging, and even some kind of annular calcification, if they are present, it can interfere with the uh, interpretation of POP scanning. Okay. So, whenever you suspect a cardiac amyloidosis with ECG, echo, and POP scan, if it is grade zero, they say it is cardiac amyloidosis unlikely. 
grade one, you need to have biopsy, and grade two, grade three, even biopsy is also not required. You can go ahead and treat for tra treat for transthyretin amyloidosis. If you see this, so even if you suspect, if you want to confirm, ultimately the cardiac biopsy is the gold standard. You need to have a tissue diagnosis and proper categorization of any kind of cardiac amyloidosis. This is our one of our study which I've done recently, and it was published in uh, JSCC. So. We have done a surgically excised aortic valve in 46 patients and we could able to demonstrate that amyloid deposition was seen in about 77% of these valves. But out of this 77%, 58 were found to be transthyretin deposition on the valve substance. But all these patients on septal biopsy, we could not even demonstrate any kind of amyloid deposition in the myocardium and the mean age of this patient is somewhere around 65 years, so younger age group. And when we evaluated POP scan in all those patients, only three patients showed a grade two, grade three positivity, although out of 19, they showed TTR positivity. Again, there is a big question mark, what is the minimum type amount of deposition of TTR when it is there that can be picked up by POP scan? Again, it's a question mark. So, when we diagnose cardiac amyloidosis, the main motto is what type of amyloid is getting deposited in the heart because we need to subcategorize because treatment and prognosis depends on the amyloid subtyping. The first thing what we do is when the amyloid, cardiac amyloidosis comes, the extensive workup of multiple myeloma including bone marrow, serum electrophoresis, urine electrophoresis, plasma cell clonality, everything will be done according to the multiple myeloma protocol. If you find any evidence of M protein, increased level of gamma globulins in urine or serum, so it shows that it is a light chain deposition and the biopsy, most of the times, even if you do biopsy, do amyloid characterization, it is a light chain deposition of amyloid. So, light chain deposition of cardiac amyloid is one of the most common type. So, we have, have to exclude it by simple uh, doing multiple myeloma workup. If it comes positive, can treat the patient like multiple myeloma protocol. Then, whether the cardiac, when we evaluating cardiac biopsy, whether other systems are also involved in amyloid deposition or we have to evaluate. If other systems are involved, any internal organ biopsy, either by abdominal fat pad biopsy, liver biopsy, kidney biopsy, rectal biopsy, if the patient, if this accessible, easy to do biopsy, you can demonstrate and subcategorization of amyloid can be done in these biopsies. But when the cardiac amyloidosis is predominantly the cardiac organ is involved, you have to do endomyocardial biopsy for proper subcategorization. So, when the biopsy is done, how do we go about it? So, first we do a simple routine stain called HND, and you will see the amyloid, eosinophilic deposition of amyloid either in the vessel wall or in the interstitium, or also sometimes you see the big nodular deposition in the subendocardial cells. So once we find this kind of an eosinophilic amyloid material, then we do Congo red stain. So Congo red stain is specific stain for amyloid, which takes up this congophilic uh, stain on wherever the amyloid deposition is there. And there is crystal wall stain we also do that we also make show metachromatic stain on that amyloid deposition. Once Congo red stain is present, we visualize these tissue sections on polarized microscopy. If you see apple green bioefringence, it is it's the confirmation for amyloid deposition. So once amyloid deposition is confirmed, we have a panel of immunohistochemical uh, antibodies like serum amyloid A protein, kappa light chain, lambda light chain, and transthyretin. We do it routinely in all the endomyocardial biopsies suspected for cardiac amyloidosis. Depending on the interpretation, if you see this image, this shows the negative for SAA, negative for kappa, negative for lambda, maybe mild positivity, but this patient showed strong positivity for transthyretin type of amyloid. So next step is what? You can treat the patient as transthyretin according to the protocol. And all those patients who have transthyretin deposition, we have a protocol to carry out mutation studies in these patients. We'll take a family history and we'll also see any kind, if we identify any mutation in the proband, we also screen the similar mutation in the those family members. So is it confirmatory? So along with that, IHC is one thing. You can do immunofluorescence also by immunofluorescent labeled antibodies, DIF. You need to have a frozen section. 
If you have other biopsy, peripheral organ biopsy, it is easy. But in endomyocardial biopsy, because biopsy is very tiny, to carrying out uh, DAF is difficult. We do carry out routinely the IHC protocols. This is one more patient which is classically showed at the lambda light chain deposition. So by doing simple panel of IHC, you can characterize the type of amyloid and ask the clinician to treat it. But is it easy? It's not always easy. Sometimes you will see deposition like this. In this biopsy, you see a light chain deposition and also trans chain deposition. What to do? So, whenever you are evaluating cardiac amyloidosis or any kind of an amyloidosis, thing is, you have to do a multidisciplinary approach with proper evaluation of multiple myeloma protein, M protein, and etc. along with the biopsy. Then only, in most of the cases, you will come to your final diagnosis. Again, it is difficult. Then what next? If you have any, this is applicable for almost of the patient. In cardiac amyloidosis, more than 95% of the patient, you will get an answer. Either it is a light chain or it is a trans -theratin. But other rare type of amyloidosis can also be present in the amyloid. So how do you identify them? That can be done by doing laser micro dissection and mass spectrometric, liquid chromatography and mass spectrographic analysis. Laser micro dissection, what we do, we'll take a congruent stain slide Wherever the congruent positivity will dissect both protein deposition in a specified tubes and will process under liquid chromatography and mass spectrography where the evaluation will depend on the weight and charge of the molecule. It characterizes the proteins. What protein, predominant protein is getting deposited. It is the gold standard and final step to confirm a definite type of amyloidosis, but it is not always required in all the patients. Along with that, last one or two slides. So when you have a diagnosis, difficult and clinically everything suspect, even in Congo red, you cannot be able to pick up when there is amyloid is very minimal, you can as well do electron microscopy and demonstrate these amyloid fibrils in tissue biopsy. This is the flow chart, how we carry out when we suspect cardiac amyloidosis that I have mentioned in my talk. So why? It is always necessary because patient prognosis, individualized treatment therapy is available and we need to have a good collaborator all over India to document all this cardiac amyloidosis subtyping so that proper patient care and treatment can be given to them. Thank you very much. Since we are short on time, I'll just ask you one question, Dr. Sudhir. Uh, you just talked about uh, mass spectrometry. So, uh, is it easily and readily available in India or uh, what to, how to follow about it and do we do it in all cases of amyloid? Uh, it's actually a very good question. So, mass spectrometric, it is a high-end technique. Only few centers in India they have and the cost approximately, I think Dr. Ashwin, you know, somewhere in lakhs, it comes in from 50,000 or lakhs. So, so when you can uh, identify a diagnose with a proper protocol, if you follow the protocol, 99% of the time you will get, you will get an answer by simple doing IHC and multiple myeloma protocols. In those cases, LCMS is not required. But when you have a doubt in multiple myeloma, cases are negative, no M bands, and you are seeing combination of kappa, lambda, trans -theratin. Sometimes all are negative and you are seeing congruent positive. So those kind of cases, you need to have in. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I will like to add one point. Yes. I used to talk about technetium PYP scan. Mm -hmm. PYP scan is a basically a bone, <coughs> bone seeking agent. Nowadays, because of calcium deposition in, in the fibril, the PYP locates it. It's all really. And when you said the evaluation of the scan, that there's a variation in the observer variations are there. Definitely. <coughs> there two ways to look at. One is to look at the comparative whether the bone tissue uptake. With the, the cardiac uptake, you compare. You say less than bone uptake, equal to bone uptake, more than bone uptake. Another, another method is of quantification. Where you quantify the heart and lung ratio. You draw ROI over the heart and over the control of the lung. And then you take a ratio of it, and then that ratio will never be observer dependent. Correct. And that ratio is a cutoff of 1.5. That Correct. cutoff, more than 1.5, is considered as are positive. <clears throat> that is what is a definite, a def almost a definitive scan. It has a very high 
honesty and sincerity of almost 99 percent. That is what I wanted to add on. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, sir. For that reference, it has to be done in an individual institutional based, and we are trying for that because we are not having proper TTR positive amyloidosis. Hardly one case once in a while, even for training and referring that value is difficult. I know, I understand because I am working here in AIM Jodhpur. In the last four years, I have done. So, this is what I am a nuclear physician. Correct. Sir. That is what is the issue, major issue. Correct. If we do more number of cases, definitely we will become more confident and definitely we will devise more ways to fight. Correct. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sirs. Now I would like to invite the next speaker, Dr. Ravi Kumar, who is the senior transplant card cardiologist from Department of Heart and Lung Transplant, MGM Hospital, Chennai. He'll be talking on emerging therapies in cardiac amyloid. Thank you, Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I uh, really thank uh, organizer, Dr. Deora, Professor Talwar, and uh, also the amyloid group led by Dr. Ashwini Thakur from IIT Kanpur. So I think uh, this disease is actually one which has uh, received very little attention, and especially as clinicians, we deal with so many other problems. I mean, cardiac diseases, coronary artery disease, and then heart failure, then leads to talk and all that, heart transplant. But this area has really led to very little, and that is in our country. So now, uh, the previous two speakers already covered most of the aspects. I would just like to just focus on the newer therapies uh, that are available in the clinical arena, what are the drugs available. So cardiac amyloid basically is an infiltrative cardiomyopathy, and uh, basically misfolded protein which uh, deposits in the myocardium, and that produces uh, early phase, something like uh, diastolic dysfunction, and then... Uh, um, it can even mimic STM type, and in late stage leads to a, a lower systolic dysfunction, heart failure. That can cause be on the right side, the left side, the left ventricle, and the right ventricle. So basically, it has got two precursors. One is what is called the trans uh, thyretin amyloid, which has been already mentioned, and one which is from immunoglobulin, which comes from amyloid fibrils from basically monoclonal light chains, like diseases like myeloma. <coughs> So the clean, main clinical type, CM-ATTR, wild type. So this is basically the wild type amyloid, what we see in the elderly persons, older persons, and no clear family history or familiar gene is uh, recognized. Other one is the familial type of cardiomyopathy, and other one is basically light chain cardiomyopathy. And see as uh, the patho the, uh, how the disease progresses, the pathophysiology. So one, one aspect is this light chain, which again leads to light chain misfolding, AL fibrils, the heart. The other one is from the trans thyretin pathway, Transferritin actually is a protein found in the blood and uh, it actually mutates, so because of mutation it misfolds and gets deposited in various organs. Not only heart, there are other organs. <coughs> so it's TT or TTR is protein, mainly it is produced in the liver and has some functions like carrying of vitamin A in the blood and uh, four subunits and when this misfolds and aggregates, it causes these types of amyloid deposits. So basically the disease burden, uh, epidemiology studies in India are really not known because uh, basically except one or two big institutes like AIMS, other places, there is uh, no uh, kind of data analysis at the uh, various levels, clinical levels. <coughs> but the mortality in patients with AGTCR really is quite significant, leads to progressive heart failure and medium survival time, for example, in hereditary AGTR would be 26 to 62 months, the wild type would be even less. So, ATTR and heart, there are a myriad of presentations, variety of presentations. What would be a, one would be HEF or heart failure with preserved digestive fraction. Other side is arrhythmia and conduction disturbance. There could be aortic stenosis like this. And all of them lead, can lead to end stage heart failure and cardiomyopathy. So, again, the, from the extra cardiac science, this we have to be very aware. The problem in this disease is, as somebody mentioned, it's a beautiful kind of uh, diagnosis on the microscopy, beautiful disease, but give, Beautiful pathology, but ugly disease. And it is very deceptive. So you really sometimes can have eye, eye problem, you can have carpal tunnel, 
presentation or renal kind of presentation. So it's very difficult for the clinician to really pick it up at the early stage. As far as heart is concerned, so myocardial thickness is increased. So the heart failure, what we can find is heart failure more than 65 years, AS with heart failure, or there are uh, decreased QRS voltage and uh, pseudo Q waves. This could be some of the clues to amyloid. And as the previous speaker has mentioned, the diagnosis actually comes through electrocardia ECG, so ECG having conduction disorder, pseudo infarct pattern, low voltage, etc. And again, cardiac MRI, as uh, Dr. has mentioned, that really it gives a, quite a significant or definitive diagnosis. So in most, more all T1 and T2 imaging, and then the late gadolinium enhancement, really some of them, they do pick up and tell us that, yes, this is a case of a cardiac uh, amyloid. So uh, the gold standard, of course, is endomyocardial biopsy. So in our series, in which I was with Dr. Bala, uh, for the last nine, ten years, we had uh, about five cases of amyloid cardiomyopathy. Uh, actually, they were in families, but uh, because they came in very early times, some of them were in 2013-14, we uh, you know, couldn't do a clear genetic test, but they were in the same families. And the endomyocardial biopsy did show kind of congruent staining, and they did the other immunofluorescent staining, polaroid microscopy also confirmed the presence of amyloid. And out of these five patients, uh, three already had heart transplant, and they're fairly doing well. The other diagnostic tool is the nucleus scintigraphy using uh, the biphosphonate scintigraphy, and that looks like is also prominent. And the other, you should always, you should always, not forget the AL type of amyloid. So when you are seeing such a case, you should look for serum protein electrophoresis. That means the monoclonal light chains have to be looked for: urine protein, serum proteins, or serum FSGS. <clears throat> now coming to the drugs. So, of course, you treat heart failure with loop diuretics, TDMT, and all the army and all the whatever we have in our armamentarium, Barosigot is new. Now, at autonomic dysfunction is one thing which has always been described in amyloid because of the involvement of nerves. And one drug called Midodrine, especially the postural hypertension, has found to be useful along with pyridostigmine and lack compression stocking. So, this does help in patients who have frequent postural hyperotension yeah, and uh, pre syncope. And there may also be heart blocks, of course, then you have to be treated like any complete heart block. There could be arrhythmias, AF, or rarely other arrhythmias treated with RF ablation and uh, anti arrhythmic drugs. The amyloid light chain, you know, what do you do? What is the approach? The approach in that is just like what you treat uh, the basic cause, so B cell leukemia or multiple myeloma. So, generally, classically, a chemotherapy is given for 28 days, four cycles of the cyborg regime. Yeah, then that is bortezomib, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone, and immunotherapy like with using drugs like daratumumab are also found to be useful. And significantly, these drugs, along with thalidomide and other drugs, have found to actually reduce the severity of uh, the amyloid associated with this light chain uh, disease. What about basic TTR amyloid, which is a common garden disease which we see? The important drugs which have come are the ATTR gene stabilizing drugs. So, tafamidin is one drug now which has come into the actually Indian market now by Pfizer, and that is uh, actually very promising. And the trials have given good results. And now, of course, we have very small uh, studies in India which are trying out. The other drug is what is called diflunosal, also called the poor man's tafamidin. Again, there are some studies on this. The newer drugs are the ATTR gene silencers, patisiran and inotersin. I'm going to talk about immunotherapy drugs using gene editing, etc., and the degraded drugs which have always been there, like doxycycline. So, tafamidis basically is a tetrameric protein. Uh, I mean, TTR is a tetrameric protein which transforms retinol, and tafamidis is a drug, it's a benzoxol, which actually stabilizes this drug. So, once you take it orally, it stabilizes the TTR in the blood, and uh, hence it doesn't allow it to fold. So, in a way, it's an anti amyloid, one of the classical anti amyloid drugs, which was first. Uh, found and uh, developed and then clinically checked uh, by trials. So one of the trials called ATTR-ACT published in 2018, this drug at various doses, 80 milligram, 20 and placebo, uh, was studied uh, for a period of 30 to 72 months after that. So it was a phase two trial, I think. And uh, in the inclusions were age up to 90 years, confirmation by biopsy, cardiac involvement, echo, uh, the various parameters, history of heart failure with hospitalization, high, Intracardiac pressures by cap, anti BMP high, six minute walk, so about 100 they are taken as the cut mark. Exclusions, heart failure not due to transferritin, transferritin amyloid, class 4 NYHA, light chain amyloid, if it is there, they are not taken, 
history of heart or liver transplant, they are not taken. Implanted devices, etc., or EGFR less than 25. Kidney pain, kidney disease, they are not taken in this study. And then what they find is that uh, after a period of 30 months, there is a significant uh, mortality, survival benefit of uh, tafimidis. And uh, also there is a hospitalization rates are significantly reduced. This is what is the finding. And the other thing, all cause, all cause mortality is reduced. Frequency of cardiovascular disease and hospitalization is reduced. The other secondary endpoints like six minute walk and this cancer questionnaire and TB and PA and statistics have shown a, a beneficial or a good uh, positive uh, impact or positive effect. So this is also NTBMP as this study shows has come down with 80 milligram tafamidis. And safety wise it has been no serious side effects or treatment, emergent adverse events. TIFEs have been found to be very minimal. And uh, in a few cases of probably allergy or anaphylaxis, they are not reported any significant organ-related uh, side effects. And relative risk reduction actually has also been shown by this drug. So now coming to the other drug called ATTR stabilizer, Diflunasal. Diflunasal has been around for a long time. It's something like NSAID related drug, so not that expensive. So Tafamidis now, Pfizer has got it, it cost, uh, monthly cost would be around uh, 1.2 lakhs. So I use it, we have, we have it in our clinic, now it's available, but obviously we can't give for most other persons because of the cost. Diflunasal is another drug advocated by many cardiologists who are working in this field. So it is anti-inflammatory, oral, bioavailable, it could be given as BID dose. There are a few trials, phase 1 and phase 2, using 200 patients non-randomized, just shown a reduced rate of progress of TTR amyloid. The other drugs are uh, the modern ones, the gene silencer drugs. So basically, patisseran is a small uh, SI RNA or small RNA binding to RNA complex, prevents formation of TTR protein, even intravenously, it was tried out in the Apollo B trial, uh, on 225 patients with positive results. The other drug is ATTR gene silencer called inotersan, all, it's all in oligonucleotide inhibitor, uh, given as subcutaneous infection in, injections. And it has found to have some, it has some uh, side effect like vitamin A, metabolism, etc. So, uh, adverse effects on that. Out of that, intravenous, intravenous patisseran seems to be much more uh, tolerable, much tolerable than, uh, tolerated than um, the other drug, intoseran. It's higher, but higher side effects were found with intoseran like thrombocytopenia and glomerulonephrine. The other drugs like do doxycycline, which are basically ATTR degraded drugs, I've been tried in some tr trials and as well as clinicians have used it, doxycycline with orso-deoxycholic acid. And at least they found the efficacy, especially uh, for the symptoms, some type of symptoms as well as the non-cardiac symptoms. And it could be a cheaper option, phase 3 studies are pending. And other drugs which are in the horizon are the anti-immunotherapy drugs like ATTR immunotherapy drugs, like ATTR monoclonal antibodies, so it's just undergoing a small, small phase 1 trial and other drugs which are again monoclonal antibodies, so ATTR, all the types. The other advanced therapies for amyloid, now these drugs obviously were not available to us for a long time in India. Only now uh, we have this uh, uh, Vindamax, this is heart transplantation. So that was a classical, uh, uh, what we had, we talked Bala's cases, Sandeep, uh, you also would agree with me. The previously when we had such a sick patient, no other option, we had done transplant. And surprisingly many of these patients now we have six and seven years survival, and not much of the extra renal problem. So that means the amyloid has not come back anytime. Maybe because of the immunosuppression. Heart and liver transplant has been described if there is patient has severe neuropathy and liver involvement. Again, we are not seeing such cases here. LVAD or artificial pump has been described in literature because of the small LV cavities. So people are used as a, a pump or an inflow canal into the left, left atrium. And total artificial heart is obviously a last option if there's a biventricular severe failure and there's a bridge to heart. So these are experience of four cases of TTR, amyloid, cardiomyopathy. They were familial cases. And all five, actually all four cases are crossed five years now. This is, so it's a five years survival. So in effect, uh, I think trans, trans serotonin amyloid cardiomyopathy is commonly misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed condition. And non-invasive diagnosis is possible. Tissue biopsy is a cornerstone. There are exciting drugs available now like ATTR stabilizer drugs, silencer drugs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for a comprehensive talk on the therapy aspects. Uh, lot of time. I'm discuss with him. Uh,
Evening, Ms. Boyting. Over the course of this session, we have had the privilege of delving into various aspects of various insightful topics. For this, I am grateful to all our speakers. To present our speakers with mementos, I would like to call upon the stage Dr. Poonam Elhen. I would also like to extend my request to Dr. Ravi Kumar, Dr. Ashwini Thakur, and Dr. Sudhir Arava to come on the stage to receive the memento as a token of appreciation for their insightful presentations. Now, I would request Dr. Poonam Elhens to present Dr. Ravi Kumar with a memento. Then I would request Dr. Poonam Agents to present a memento to Dr. Asma Nalwa. Pardon? Uh, pardon, ma'am, pardon. Just excuse me. Pardon. To Dr. Ashwini Thakur. Followed by a memento to Dr. Sudhir Arava. Now, as a gesture of appreciation for their valuable contributions to today's session, I would like to extend a request to Dr. Sandeep Seth to present a memento to each of our esteemed dignitaries of the dais. I'd request Dr. Sandeep Seth Now again, I would request Dr. Poonam Elhens to present a memento to each of our dignitaries. I request ma'am to present Dr. Rajesh Kumar with a memento. Followed by Dr. Asman Alwa. Receiving the memento from Dr. Poonam Agents. And again, lastly, I would request Dr. Poonam Agents to present a memento to Dr. Rengarajan. Now, for the last session of the today, we are heading to the heart failure, the conundrum. In this session, we are going to know about targeting novel pathways for heart failure and fine-tuning the management in reference to the advanced heart failure, along with other insightful topics. To initiate the session, I would like to call upon the stage Dr. Yash Paul Sharma and Dr. Kapil Bhargava as chairpersons and as panelists, I would call upon the stage Dr. Ravi Inanya, Dr. Abhinav Dikshit, Dr. Pramod Chandolia, Dr. Nitish R. Mahapatra, and Dr. Rakesh Mahala. I request all of you to come on the stage and take your seats. From here, I would request Dr. Yash Paul Sharma and Dr. Dr. Kapil Bhargava to initiate this session so that we can embark on a journey of exploration and learning. Good evening. I, I think in the last session, we will be having four lectures. First will be 
by Dr. Satya Mangala Prashad. He'll be speaking on targeting novel pathways for heart failure, possibilities and implications. Dr. Satya Mangala Prashad, please. He's from Cleveland Clinic, Lerner College of Medicine. He uh, has a vast this one experience in heart failure therapies and pathways. Good evening, everybody. I think our session holds everybody till the end of the day. So uh, I'm Satya Mangala Prasad. They go by as Prasad. Um, I am a professor of molecular medicine, as slide shows. Uh, my lab basically has been working on looking at novel pathways for heart failure. And today, I would like to convince you the idea that what traditionally has been used as beta blockers may not be the right way to look at it. I think, I think we need to reverse the idea that maybe it's not beta blockers, but rather to activate the receptor to start target heart failure. So let me go back to some of the basic biology of work that I'm going to set so that we can talk about the idea that what pathways we're looking for in heart failure could be altered. And I think maybe we need to come up with new therapies. So this is basically one of, one of my mentor's work that shows a basic setup, what is known as adrenergic receptor system, which is where the beta blockers target. Beta blockers target the receptor, therefore block this pathway. And hope I can convince you that targeting this receptor would be actually detrimental. So what you see is the receptor system that gets activated, and then you get coupling to the G protein, and then you get cyclic AMP generation. That's a classic process. And then when the receptor gets activated, it gets phosphorylated by an enzyme called G protein coupled receptor kinase that shuts the receptor off. So in this process, basically the two main key mechanisms. One is the process that's called desensitization, that is the shutting of the receptor, and the other is called the resensitization, that's the recovery of receptor function. So what happens is the receptor gets activated, it gets phosphorylated, becomes inactive, and then it gets desensitized. And then once it's inside, inside the cell, it gets dephosphorylated and is recycled back. So this is the classic process of homeostasis that occurs in cardiomyocytes, and that's what keeps the heart functioning. So traditionally, this is how we represent a function of cardiac contraction where you activate the receptors by either the beta-1 or beta-2, and then you get generation of cyclic AMP that leads to contraction. That's the baseline mechanism. But in conditions of heart failure, the following things happen. So you activate what is called the G-protein coupled receptor kinase that phosphorylates this receptor. And then you've got this enzyme called PI3 kinase. Together, they basically shut the system off. And therefore, you have less contraction. So if you think about this, this is what happens in heart failure. It's already the receptors are shut off. And the cardiac function is getting bad. On top of it, you come with beta blockers, and what you'd see? I think you're basically targeting an already shut system. So this is where we thought that we should actually think about an alternative mechanism of looking at this process. So the classic mechanism that we do in our lab is actually a mouse model, where we actually open up the chest of the mouse, tie what is called a suture around the iota, and develop a hypertensive mouse model of heart failure, and that's what is called transverse aortic constriction. And you can echo the image in the mice, and shown here is basically an outcome where you can see this dilation by 12 weeks. But we actually used a transgenic mouse where you overexpress this enzyme, inactive enzyme, and you can recover this function. Suggesting that this pathway that you're looking at, which never been mentioned previously, could be used for recovery of cardiac function. So these studies basically suggested that receptors can actually undergo dephosphorylation resensitization, but Keeping this receptor functional may be an underlying mechanism because the biochemistry that is shown in this paper, I'm not going to talk about it because I'm going to talk about the next steps. So traditionally, what you're looking at is this pathway that has been targeted by beta blockers. This pathway, there's a secondary half. The second half of the whole complex has never been talked about. And the question is, can we target this pathway? And so if we can reactivate this pathway, can you actually make the heart better? 
That's where we thought that we should actually focus on. So I'm going to take you to some of the basic biochemistry journey of where we reached to this pathway and how we're actually developing this new set of small molecules targeting this pathway. So through a series of papers, we actually identified the basic biochemical mechanism of what is called the phosphatase dysfunction. So phosphatase has never been targeted in heart failure till now. So there are two labs working in the world. One is my lab and there's one lab in Germany where we study alterations of phosphatase pathways that can actually change receptor function. So what we actually found out was that this enzyme that we identified this upregulator can actually phosphorylate this intermediate protein that inhibits this phosphatase function. This inhibition of phosphatase function keeps the receptor dysfunctional. So the, I told you that in heart failure, there's loss of receptor function, and the loss of receptor function, we think, is because the receptors are not getting dephosphorylated or becoming functional, and so the idea is that can be targeted. So I'm sure, going to show you a simple example of this uh, cellular pathway. So what we did is basically knock this particular protein off, and then once we knocked it off, you're looking at how the receptors look like. So these are beta-2 expressing cells, and what you're looking at is a confocal microscopy, and what you're looking at phosphorylation receptors, and we actually took the cells off that is shown in the green. So we can better appreciate this actual confocal image here, where you can see that the cells that are green don't have this inhibitor protein. And so the idea of our process is to keep the receptor functional, and to keep the receptor functional, we actually have to dephosphorylate it. So we basically target this protein in the cell, and you're looking for a phospho phosphorylated receptors. You can see the neighboring cell that doesn't have the knockdown or loss of this protein, the receptors are phosphorylated. You can actually target this protein by an SARNA. You can see that the receptors remain dephosphorylated. So just suggests that if you can just target this particular protein, you can keep the receptor functional, then you should be able to recover cardiac function. So that is a completely novel pathway, and the idea that classically you keep the receptor shut, but we want to actually reverse the idea and say we want a receptor operational and can be risky heart failure. That's our thought process. So to confirm this, we actually went through a series of mouse models. Out of this, I'm going to only talk about three of them to show you, at least provide an evidence, that targeting this pathway can actually risk your heart failure. So what we did was we actually went through the process of identifying where this protein is getting phosphorylated, made the mice by selectively mutating this protein at these sites. And then we generated three different mouse models where one of them is like a wild type, the other one is like a one that could mimic the actual inactive protein and one that would actually be an active protein. So what I would mean by active is that an active protein inhibits the phosphatase and therefore the receptors will be more phosphorylated, mimicking heart failure in an accelerated fashion. And then once you do that, we actually subject these mice to TAC, like I told you, and then you're basically looking at cardiac function. So if you see a normal mice, we can see that by 12 weeks of TAC, there is dilation. But if you overexpress this protein that we think would be a great target, you can start seeing that this is more dilated than what you see. And these are the ejection fraction and fraction shorter measurements shown here. And then this is the immunohistochemistry chemistry of the same. But if you actually use a protein that is inactive, then you can see that cardiac function is still maintained. And this is shown down below in the immunohistochemistry chemistry that you see, that if you take the sham, you can see well-defined cardiac structures. But if you actually overexpose the wild type, it dilates more than the normal wild type. But if you actually act, express an inactive protein, then the cut heart remains okay. It doesn't get dysfunctional. So this suggests that if you actually target this protein, you can, it's actually a new pathway that you can use for heart failure. On the flip side, if you overexpress an active protein, what happens? Even at baseline, you start seeing remodeling in the heart. And by, if you subject this mice to surgery, then you can see that these mice get dilated hearts. So this suggests that, that if you actually have an active protein, then you basically would have heart failure. So this is all in mice. Fine, what happens in the human heart? Right? So we went back, uh, Cleveland Clinic is famous for having a lot of human heart failure samples. We've got a repository of 2,000 hearts. We can pick and choose whatever we want. We basically took, took DCM as a primary target, and then we started looking at what happens for this protein in this mice, in the heart, in the human hearts. So what you can see here is a complete biochemical analysis as well as immunohistochemistry. chemistry. And this, I'll just go to the immunohistochemistry chemistry because I think this is, a, this is a complex mechanism to describe. So in terms of the just general immunohistochemistry, chemistry, what we're looking at is h &E staining for the normal heart and the dilated cardiomyopathic heart. And so what we see is that in h &E staining, there's some significant disorder of the, of the cardiomyocytes. Also, we can see significant phosphorylation receptor. As I told you before, phosphorylation receptor reflects heart failure or cardiac dysfunction, and then 
We traditionally use beta blockers in this setting. So you would expect that the receptors are not seeing anything already and you're giving them beta blockers. And the question is, can we reverse it? And the, on the other hand, we also developed this, uh, identified whether this particular protein that we identified in our pathway, is it expressed and is it altered? As we can see that in ha human heart failure, this, it's significantly upregulated. So this suggests that upregulation of this protein, targeting this pathway, actually makes the receptors inactive. And then, since the receptors are inactive, then you will not be able to rescue, the, rescue this uh, chronic dysfunction if you give them beta blockers. So this actually supported a hypothesis saying that if you can target this pathway, can you make it better? I think we can make it better. So our overall hypothesis is that in normal conditions, that is homeo in homeostasis, you actually have a receptor that is bound by an agonist, you get through, it becomes inactive, but goes into the cell, undergoes dephosphorylation, is reversed back. So this is the classic homeostatic pathway that we see in terms of basic mechanism. But in conditions of heart failure, you get agonist binding, and this agonist binding should activate the receptor. The receptor gets phosphorylated because there's sympathetic overdrive, like Dr. Dalla talked about, and then the receptor becomes dysfunctional. It becomes dysfunctional because there is dephosphorylation deficit. The dephosphorylation deficit is because there's an inhibition of this phosphatase activity, and because the phosphatase activity cannot dephosphorylate the receptor, you get accumulation of phosphorylated receptors. And therefore, you will not be able to have more receptors on cell surface, so you lose receptors over a period of time. So now, if you come back to the original idea that as heart failure happens, there's a sympathetic overdrive. Why does the sympathetic overdrive happen conceptually? The idea is that it happens conceptually because your heart starts losing receptors. As it starts losing receptors, the feedback system says that we need to regenerate more sympathetic hormones to actually normalize the function. And therefore, what happens is that you start getting sympathetic overdrive. Now you relate it to the clinical idea. If you give beta blockers, keep on increasing beta blockers for a period of time. Why? Because you have only a small fraction of active receptors. You shut those receptors, and therefore, there's a feedback system for more sympathetic overdrive. But in this case, if you actually keep the receptors functional, then you would expect that this sympathetic overdrive will be reduced or at least impaired. And therefore, we can have a better mitigation of heart failure. So that is what our hypothesis is. And we have done studies in the mouse models. In those mouse models that I showed you, we actually don't see sympathetic overdrive in the one that has got reduction in heart failure. So this supports our idea that targeting this pathway could be a very nice new tool uh, in, term of, in terms of developing therapeutic strategies. So our hypothesis is that this pathway, that's called the desensitization pathway, has been targeted currently. Uh, there's been no tools or, or at least mechanisms available to understand this. So we have set the stage to say that this is the mechanism for the other arm of the phosphorylation mechanism of the receptor function, and if you can target this molecule, this pathway, this molecule by a small molecule inhibitor, you can then basically unlock the phosphatase activity, dephosphorylate the receptor, make the receptor functional, and if you can keep the receptors functional, then you would actually reduce the sympathetic overdrive that is seen in the conditions of heart failure. So we've developed a small molecule, and we recently received a grant. Hopefully, we should be able to get an FDA approval for this for clinical trials. So I think I will end two seconds before the time. Thank you. An excellent talk. Rather, a new concept you have given. Uh, just one question. DCM patients, when you improve the ejection fraction, how did you keep on this pathway and uh, made this uh, desensitization more favorable for outcome? So this is actually a tissue that we have got. So the idea is that we had to confirm that this pathway is altered even in humans, because this pathway is not shown till now in any other system. So we only taken these samples to show that this pathway is altered. And once we go through the different phases of using the small molecule, when only when it goes into humans, that's the time when we can actually show that this pathway is important. So when you are publishing this data, yeah, this is unpublished data, you are under, still under press, when it's going to come? I should say that it's in review and circulation, so it should come out anytime soon. Because we have seen that uh, nowadays improvement in ejection fraction, which is occurring at a very great extent, that is beyond beta blocker and other drugs. Because sometimes blood pressure is 90, retinin is 3, and the, all things are contraindicated in these all four pillars. But the improvement in ejection fraction is tremendous with the medications. 
So this new pathways, maybe that we were just focusing earlier on beta blocker and others. There are some other pathways which will be very useful, and they will avoid a lot of uh, this one further intervention and medical treatment will be very effective for heart failure. We hope so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, this question answer we can take in the half. The time is. I am pleased to welcome the next speaker, Dr. Rohit Mathur, who is currently Professor and Head of Cardiology at SN Medical College, Jodhpur. And he will be elaborating on management of hospitalized F5 patients with the right guideline directed medical therapy. It is uh, supposed to be a case based discussion. So, Dr. Rohit Mathur, please. Thank you, organizers, Dr. Surender, and dignitaries on dais. <clears throat> so, uh, we are going to talk about management of hospitalized patients of HEFREF with the right guideline-directed me medical therapy, a uh, case-based approach. So, heart failure in India is a big challenge, not because there are too many of these patients suffering from heart failure, but also because readmission rates in India is close to 33%. And sadly, one-third of these HEFREF patients would die within first year of their diagnosis and a productive life years. Hospital readmission, be it the first admission or readmission, increases mortality. And to the tune that every hospitalization increases death risk up to three times the normal. In India, a suboptimal GDMT could be one of the reasons of rehospitalization. In a study done by Harikrishnan and co-workers, they have shown that only 19% of the patients had optimal GDMT when discharged. That means that upside of 75% did not receive optimal GDMT at discharge. As my presentation is case-based, let us see two cases. The first is Mrs. R, who happens to be a 60-year-old retired school teacher. She was a known case of Elvis's leg dysfunction on loop diuretics, ARBs, MRAs, and beta blocker. And one fine day, she presents to emergency with acutely decompensated heart failure with LV ejection fraction of 30% and high anti-pro BNP. The second is a case of 60-year-old male who presents with first episode of acutely decompensated heart failure. And he is having hypertension, a decreased saturation, tachycardia, LV hypertrophy, and ejection fraction of 28%. So both are similar case of HEFREF, but they have some difference that one is a de novo case of HEFREF and other is a known case of uh, poor LV with the acute exacerbation. Now, why I'm insisting on starting DDMT at index hospitalization? What are the benefits? So if you see that ACE inhibitors or ARB, we do not have well-designed randomized trial to prove that initiating ACE inhibitor or ARB during index hospitalization would improve mortality or for that purpose quality of life. As far as MRAs are considered, there is one observational single center study which has shown that delayed initiation of MRA therapy, 30 to 90, 90 days post discharge, is associated with significant increase in mortality. As far as beta blockers are considered, we have one impact heart failure trial which have shown that there is trends for benefit if we start beta blocker, particularly carvedilol, in hospital vis a -vis starting beta blocker after two weeks of discharge. But we have ample and robust uh, data for starting secubital valsartan in index hospitalization of the patient. Now let us quickly review what the recent guidelines have to say about, in, about uh, initiating and optimizing guideline-directed ma maximal therapy during hospitalization phase. Now, ACC expert uh, consensus decision pathway recommends that GDMT is to be started as soon as possible during hospitalization phase. Now, whether you want to start beta blocker first or ACE inhibitor first is a uh, controversy right from CBS3 trial. and. Uh, they recommend that either RAS inhibitor or beta blocker can be started 
at times it can be prudent to start both of them simultaneously and they can be uptitrated up as fast as every two weeks. So they recommend that ideal time to consider therapy optimization is during hospitalization for HEPREF. A European 2021 guidelines, they recommend that secubital valsartan is recommended as a replacement of ACE inhibitor therapy in patients of HEPREF to reduce the risk of rehospitalization as well as that, and this is class 1B recommendation. So now, you don't need to pre-treat a patient with ACE inhibitor and then switch it over to secubital valsartan. The second thing, you don't need any anti-proBNPs to start uh, secubital valsartans. So, a treatment algorithm, if you combine both of them, you would see that a patient of stage C have ref, you start with RAS inhibitors, beta blocker, diuretic as needed, and then probably you can add on MRAs, SGLT2 inhibitors, you can up titrate or down titrate the dose of diuretics, you can add hydrolazine, ISDN, and evabrin as and when patient is indicated or uh, it is uh, fruitful. So now how do you initiate or uptitrate ARNI? ARNI is indicated in every case of HEFREF with the NYC class 2 to 4 and it can be co-administrated with the uh, beta blockers and MRAs. So if the patient is on ACE inhibitor, we have to give a 36 hours off before initiation of ARNI. If the patient is de novo for RAS or is taking less than 10 milligram equivalent of enalapril or less than 160 milligram per day of equivalent dose of valsartan, you start with 50 milligram twice a day uh, dose of uh, ARNI. And if the patient was taking more than 10 milligram per day equivalent dose of enalapril or more than 160 milligram equivalent dose of valsartan, you can start with 100 milligram twice a day. You can keep on up titrating the doses every two weeks, but you have to keep an eye on blood pressure, renal function and electrolytes. If the patient is not suitable for ARNI, that is if ARNI is contraindicated, not tolerated or inaccessible, you can still give ACE inhibitor or ARB. In this case, start with the minimum possible dose and then you can up titrate every two weeks looking at blood pressure, renal function and potassium. Beta blocker, it is to be given in every single patient of HEFREF where it is, unless it is absolutely contraindicated. There are three beta blockers which have shown evidence-based benefit, that is bisoprolol, carbidilol, mitoprolol. The initial dose is as written, and then you can increase every two weeks having a close watch on heart rate, blood pressure, and of course, signs of congestion. MRAs are a good add-on, and uh, uh, you have to start with the 25 milligram of aplerinone or 12.5 milligram spinalactone, the upper limit of dose is 25 for aplerinone and 25 for spinalactone. You have to keep uh, to, you have to keep close watch on serum potassium level, and that's why um, electrolytes are to be done at two to three days following initiation, at seven days, and then every three months when uh, the patient is on uh, MRAs. As far as uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are considered. SGLT2 inhibitors are, of course, to be given in HEFREF patient regardless of their diabetic status. Nowadays, we know that uh, SGLT2 inhibitors have shown their benefit in uh, HEFREF as well. So, uh, you can use uh, dapagliflozin at a dose of 10 milligram or empagliflozin at 10 milligram per day, provided that estimated GFR is more than 30 in case of DAPA and more than 20 in case of EMPA. So, if you combine these two, you find that uh, secubital, uh, the guideline-directed maximal therapy is to be instituted as early as possible and probably in the index hospitalization only. And initiation of secubital valsartan rather than ACE inhibitor or ARB may be considered in patient who has been hospitalized for a new onset heart failure or decompensated heart failure. Now, why why we want uh, uh, we are saying that uh, secubital valsartan is first line preference because it has shown rapid improvement in patient-related outcomes like symptoms, physical functioning, and quality of life, as well as it has been shown to affect tardive reverse remodeling as well. And there are ample of evidence, as I have already told you, like Pioneer Heart Failure Trial, where initiation of ARNI during the phase of acute decompensated heart failure hospitalization was found to be feasible 
with superior outcome in comparison to enalapril. Transition study where one half of the patient could achieve target dose within 10 weeks if it was started in hospital duration. There are multiple clinical trials who have shown that RNA is far superior RAS inhibitor in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patient. Uh, paradigm heart failure trial, true heart, heart failure trial, as well as evaluate heart failure trial, which have shown that uh, sacrificial valsartan not only improves uh, anti-pro BNP by uh, at least 28 percent in comparison to ACE inhibitor ARB, it uh, changes NYHA class favorably by 26 percent when compared with the inalapril. There are decreased edema and dyspnea on effort and there is 42% reduction in CV death or rehospitalization with RNA in comparison to inalapril. Also, the composite endpoint falls by as much as 48% if sacubital lalsartan is used during index hospitalization in patients of FREF in comparison to inalapril use. So when you see, we know that the maximal mortality benefit in a patient of HFREF is seen with beta blocker, but you, when you are combining all these EDMTs, you find that combination of RNA, beta blocker and MRA has reduced all cause mortality to maximum and to the tune of 63% and no other combination is providing that much of mortality benefit. So because of these so many supporting and data we have now uh, started putting patient directly on RNA and not putting them on ACE inhibitor or ARB uh, to start uh, RNA. And uh, in summary, I would like to say that GDMT is the foundation of uh, HFREF care and the GDMT with highest expected benefit should be prioritized, preferably started during index hospitalization. In any patient like Mrs. R or Mr. P who have either de novo heart failure or worsening of heart failure, both the recent guidelines recommend it, recommends in, uh, starting RNA in the place of ACE inhibitor or ARB and RNA has an essential heart failure reduced re ejection fraction therapy. It reduces the risk of CV death and hospitalization and improves cardiac function and stroke. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marshall, for uh, discussing in detail and uh, the direct need for RNA in heart failure patients. Any questions, any pending? I think short of time, we'll start the next uh, talk by Dr. Sandeep Seth. He's, you know, professor at Ames, Delhi, and has a great interest in heart failure. So he'll be speaking on fine tuning management of advanced heart failure. Dr. Sandeep, please. In fact, Thank in you. the beginning, Dr. Sandeep was saying that there won't be too much, but there are still 40 candidates I counted, delegates. So call is very big, but still people to listen. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Surinder for my second invitation to Ames, Jodhpur. Very nice place to come to. So almost 95% of patients of heart failure can be managed with what Rohit talked about, the four pillars of heart failure therapy. It's the 5% of patients whom we cannot manage, the patients with what we call advanced heart failure, I'm going to talk about. We already covered the burden of heart failure in India. These patients are very sick, they're younger. They have what we call the rule of three. One third of these patients after they're admitted will die. One third of them will in the next three months after a discharge, if they survive the first admission, will again get admitted or they will die. So these are very sick patients. We really need to spend time on trying to salvage these patients. If they have survived, their median survival is only just about three years. We, at any time, we all have almost 50,000 such patients. So it is a significant burden, the patients of advanced heart failure. This is a trajectory which you often see. So most of the times when you have a patient with heart failure, they'll go through the first phase. That means they, from a stage of risk of heart failure to developing heart failure, most patients will actually be manageable if they survive the first episode of the initial heart failure. And after many years of uh, therapy of heart failure, they will, some of them will reach a phase of what we call advanced heart failure where no therapy seems to work. And I'm going to focus on that area. The first therapy obviously will be managing these patients with the four pillars of therapy, which consists of a vasodilator like 
inhibitors, preferably most of these patients should at some phase be put on ARNI, which is now affordable now that it's off patent, a beta blocker. Reasonable doses of diuretics, especially uh, MRA and SCL2 inhibitors. Beyond that, they should be given adequate dose of diuretics. If need be, they should be put on devices like a CRT or a CRT-D, ICDs. Now we have a new drug like Verisigvat. I'll skip the mechanism of that. And if you understand that, you have, if you have to give five drugs, you have to give more drugs beyond that. With all that, most of these patients will actually improve. That's why we say that most of the patients will improve on these drugs. But what happens beyond that? There are a number of scores available, the number of algorithms available by which you can decide which patients will actually not be able to, which you will not be able to salvage by just these therapies. The problem with most of these scores are these are complicated scores, these are old scores. If you look at the various scores like the Seattle score, the Barcelona score, so the magic score, these are relatively old scores. This, these scores are, you have to go on to online calculators. Most of these scores don't even have things like BNP in the, in the algorithm. So what we have tried to do at AIMS is we have had a database of more than 200 patients. We have created a very simple score which you can even run in your OPD. This is what we call the HOPE score in that there's just four parameters. Hospitalization in the past six months for heart failure. Any persisting organ dysfunction. So if there is persisting renal dysfunction because of heart failure, persisting liver dysfunction because of heart failure. If the, the BNP or the anti-proBNP is staying above 2000, that means you're giving your best heart failure therapy, it's staying, staying above 2000. And the patient is unable to exercise. Just two simple questions. Can you climb up one flight of stairs? I, are you able to walk for five minutes? If you're not able to do that, that's a positive indicator. So if any of these two are positive, we have found that the next six months, the patient is at high risk for mortality. We're already now starting to validate this. Oh, in, a, in, a, in a database of more than 200 patients, we found that this had a very high sensitivity and specificity for mortality. And now we're trying to validate this. It's very simple to use, very easy to remember. So I'm gonna focus now in the next five, six minutes on two components of what is advanced heart failure and end-stage heart failure. They're not, they're not exactly synonymous, there's slight, slight differences between the two categories. So whenever you have such a patient, you would still try to reverse heart failure or optimize heart failure therapy, and then if you're still failing, then reassess the patient, and perhaps actually look for a heart failure center where advanced heart failure therapy is available. For instance, a LVAD or a transplant program is available. If the patient is not eligible for that, you have a concept of palliative therapy for heart failure. So what are these therapies? Can that patient be actually be considered for an LVAD or a transplant, or is he not eligible for that any, anymore? Will he, will he be considered for palliation? Supposing the patient is very elderly, very frail, he has irreversible kidney disease, irreversible renal disease, has a malignancy which can not be treatable, is so frail that he can't even be able to go to the bathroom. Do not consider such patients for a transplant program or LVAD. It makes no sense asking the patient to spend 70, 80 lakhs, one crore for going for a LVAD or going for a very expensive transplant program, not even surviving a transplant surgery. That patient can be made comfortable in the rest of his days of life by going for a palliative program. There are palliative programs in many of the government and some private centers, mainly run for oncology program, but now they're learning that Palliative programs can be also tailored for heart failure. Similarly, you have to choose carefully which patients will go for a transplant program, which patient will go for an LVAD program. They are again not synonymous. For instance, if you are considering a patient for an LVAD program, the LVAD is basically an LV assist device. It's not a biventricular assist device. So if the RV function is not good, this patient will not be suitable for an LV assist device, you might have to consider them for a biventricular assist device where the cost becomes double. That means instead of one crore, it becomes two crore. Similarly, for a heart transplant, again, supposing the pulmonary artery hypertension is very severe or the right ventricular function is so severe that the liver has gone into cirrhosis. So again, there's a problem with the heart transplant. So you have to go into the finer details of what patient you want to consider for what program. I, I will not go into details of this, each, each therapy you have to tailor to the patient. 
just a few words about palliative care. Palliative care in heart failure is a new concept, but gradually this therapy is also picking up. The idea is that if you have decided that this patient cannot go for any form of therapy, make the patient comfortable in the remaining years of his life. For instance, you've decided the patient is not suitable for a transplant, the patient is not suitable for a LVAD. You can give the patient inotropes on a continuous basis. Whether you want to use uh, the uh, infusion pump, give it, give an infusion pump for the patient, the patient can buy an infusion pump. You have the patient on a CRT D, the switch off the defibrillator. Discuss with the family, does, do they want repeated defibrillator shocks to make the patient uncomfortable? Remove the beta blockers. Just continue low doses of ACE inhibitors, increase the diuretic doses. Oral opioids are available, they make the patient definitely more comfortable. Give the patient anxiolytics, give the patient sedatives at night. So these are me various methods which are easily available. CPAP bypass machines can make the patient sleep at night. These are methods to make the patient more comfortable at night. You have to discuss with the patient if in case of an emergency to the patients want to come repeatedly to the emergency. So these decisions of end of life management have to be discussed with the patient. These are concepts of palliative care which we have learned from oncology and now applying more and more to heart failure. Just a quick word about some Indian in initiatives of heart failure. As you realize that heart failure is not just a doctor and patient management, we have created, extended this therapy towards creating heart failure clinics. We have one at AIMS, we have similar heart failure clinics at multiple places in, in India. We had one in Jod AIMS Jodhpur, which is now being revived again. This is, there are just some glimpses of the heart failure clinic with nurses who are the mainstay of this clinic. They run the heart failure service, providing physiotherapy, running teleclinics, giving patients counseling advice on exercise, on diet. We have fully trained heart failure nurses who run the transplant program, LVAD programming, heart failure clinics, the helpline numbers, they run the apps, the checklists. They also train other nurses. We have checklists from all aspects of patient contact in the ICU, at discharge. This is the OPD checklist. The moment patient comes, a simple checklist is implemented. Patient's weight is checked, blood pressure is checked, we go through the four pillars of therapy. Is the patient on the four pillars? If not, we note down why is the patient not on four pillars of therapy. A simple uh, card called the Hide card, which again captures the patient's data. I will skip the story here. Basically, what you have to realize is that all aspects of heart failure can be treated. And even in advanced heart failure, patient, if the patient enters a transplant program, end can often be miraculous. This is just a snap of some of our transplant patients who are now living a normal life, even playing games and winning medals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep Shet, for a elaborate and excellent talk. And now I think we move on to the next speaker. Uh, so I welcome Dr. Gautam Sharma, Professor of Cardiology. Ames New Delhi. He's an elect electrophysiologist and he will be discussing atrial fibrillation in heart failure. Thank you. Good evening. I, I think I'm the Mike Watchman, so special responsibility. So um, I'm speaking on AF in heart failure and uh, it's been referred to by the organizers very rightly as Achilles heel and I'll be telling you why appropriate. Interestingly, none of the heart failure speakers previous to me have spoken about AF in heart failure, but anyway. So this slide is showing you the prevalence of, heart, of atrial fibrillation in a heart failure, and you can see it's listing the major PHF trials, and basically it's trying to uh, show that as the heart failure worsens, as you go from NYHA class one, two to class four, the prevalence of AF in these patients increases from from uh, from left of the slide to say around four percent to almost half of the patients in class four. And why is that? To begin with, heart failure and AF they share the same risk factors, whether it's age, hypertension, smoking, obesity, CAD, and once heart failure sets in, so you have a cascade that sets in. You know, so you have the 
renin angiotensin aldosterone activation that increases the filling pressures and afterload and um, in turn that eventually increases the left atrial pressure and left atrial is very important as you all know for atrial fibrillation uh, leading eventually to atrial hypertrophy and stretch so the stretch and the hypertrophy leads to fibrosis eventually and that leads to heterogeneity of conduction so the substrate is really ripe and then along with that the autonomic nervous system gets activated and leading to eventually ectopic activity and AFib can set in and usually does so. And once a AF sets in, that then further leads to loss of atrial contraction, irregular filling because of irregular RR inter uh, intervals and rapid rate, so there's an inadequate filling which worsens heart failure. So then heart failure leads to AF and AF leads to heart failure giving rise to their death. AF begets heart failure and heart failure begets AF. This is a very interesting study. So it's, it, the authors basically tried to look at the temporal relations of atrial fibrillation and CHF and the joint influence on mortality. This was a Birmingham heart study published way back, but I like to show this. Eventually, uh, what they found here was that irrespective of whether the AF came first or heart failure came first, it, the mortality uh, worsened. So um, individuals with AF or heart failure who subsequently develop the other condition have a poor prognosis. And that's why I think the organizers very rightly referred to AF as uh, Achilles heel of heart failure. Now comes a question. AF is bad, but is sinus rhythm good? We all know about the AFIRM study, and this was a follow-up of the AFIRM study by the same authors, and this was the on-treatment analysis, looking at what, what, what was the relation of uh, sinus rhythm and survival, and what they found was that there were only two things that, that, that the survival depended on, and which, which were sinus rhythm and warfarin use. And in fact, the thing that caused worsening of modality was antirhythmic drug therapy. Now, uh, let's have a look at the rate versus rhythm heart failure trials before the ablation era. And a couple of people, uh, colleagues asked me about these before I just came in to give this talk. And they're listed here for you. You have very elegant studies. I won't go into details because of the paucity of time, but none of them showed any effect on mortality. This was the elegant study by Dennis Roy and the AFCHF investigators. This oft been quoted, and uh, this was essentially a rhythm control with amadron versus rate control, and it eventually showed that there was no survival benefit of rhythm uh, control. So wh why was rhythm control not associated with fewer cardiovascular events than rate control? Because antirhythmic drug, drugs are ineffective Number one, in controlling AF. Number two, that they have significant toxicity. And this is from, again, from the AFIRM study, that uh, all-cause mortality was worse off in, in those patients that used, that, that with anti big drug therapy used. And, and we all also know that uh, amadron use is associated with highest mortality as, as opposed to other anti big drug drugs. So then, what do we have next for rhythm control? So obviously, we're going to talk about catheter ablation. So Lee Pen Su from Michel Hesegay's group published this study way back um, in 2004. And what it showed was that if you could maintain rhythm by catheter ablation without the use of drugs in, in these patients with CHF, it significantly improves cardiac function, symptoms, exercise capacity, and quality of life. This was followed by a spate of studies the PAVA CHF study, ART HF study, the CAMTAF, the ATAC, the CAMRA MRI, very elegant study by Peter Kistler. So what all of these studies showed was improvement in EF, uh, quality of life, exercise tolerance, etc. But none of them showed any improvement in mortality. Till this landmark study, the Castle AF study. And this 
in, in this study, patients with AF and CHF, all of them received an ICP. They were randomized to ablation versus medical therapy. And the primary endpoint was a composite of death from any cause or hospitalization for heart failure. And there you have the results. And the results showed that the hospitalizations uh, were much less for, for those patients who had, for the group that had received ablation. And after almost three years of follow-up, the, the, the curves diverged for ablation versus medical therapy, and there was an improvement in death uh, from any cause. And you can see that the, the absolute change in ejection fraction, seen in, the, uh, in red for the patients who had undergone ablation, was the improvement was much better than those who had no ablation, shown in green. Now, this is the most interesting part of the, of the study that I find most interesting was that the, now the, the red bars are denoting the burden of AF in those patients who had undergone ablation. And the green bars are obviously showing the burden of AF in those who had not undergone ablation. Of course, they are much higher. But, uh, but you, please note that it's not zero in those patients who had gone, undergone ablation. What that meant was you don't have to have a complete freedom from AF. Even if the burden of AF decreases, you can still have the benefit as has been shown in this elegant study. So irrespective of whether it was paroxysmal or persistent, there was an improvement. However, the study showed that uh, the improvement was seen in patients who, had, uh, who did not have severe LV systolic dysfunction, that is, ejection fraction of less than 25% had uh, no improvement. This is the RAF AF study was, uh, again, a very elegant study from Canada, and this was led by Anthony Tang. And again, they, the, the hypothesis was that AF's ablation for AF could reduce all-cause mortality and heart failure events in patients with AF and ejection fraction of less than 45% or more than 45%. I mean, they were looking at patients with uh, reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction heart failure patients. And what they found was that all-cause mortality, which was the primary outcome, almost reached uh, significance. The secondary outcomes, uh, all of them showed improvement, they were, whether it was quality of life or exercise tolerance, anti-proBNP or ejection fraction improvement. The problem was that this study was controversially terminated because of low enrollment or low event rates. Uh, there was a big controversy about this. However, if you dichotomize the results with, in patients with less than 45% ejection fraction and more than 45% ejection fraction, you, you see that patients with less uh, than 45% ejection fraction improved with ablation. And this was almost similar to what we saw in the Castle AF um, study. What that meant was that ablation did not improve those patients who had AF and uh, heart failure and preserved uh, ejection fraction. So let's come to the guidelines. So these were the 2020 guidelines that actually were already talking about class one indication for patients with paroxysmal or persistent AF and heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Um, and, 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 the, and class 2A uh, indication for catheter ablation in patients who had failed drug therapy in, in, in this subset. So these are the latest uh, guidelines, 2023 guideline, and what the class one indication is for early and aggressive approach to AF rhythm control. And the other class one indication is for catheter ablation in, in these patients. Class 2A is reserved for patients with preserved ejection fraction. So this, this is a very, uh, I won't go into detail in this, but what I would like to point out is that these are the patients who are less likely to benefit from catheter ablation. Uh, patients obviously with advanced uh, heart failure, uh, with advanced uh, NYHA class, with a significant scar, uh, atrial uh, myopathy which is severe, advanced age and significant comorbidities. Still, we have this, again, a very interesting study. This is a, a Castle HTX study which was just published a couple of months back which was uh, actually looking at ablation in patients who had symptomatic paroxysmal or persistent AF 
and these were patients who were eligible for heart transplant due to end-stage heart failure and ejection fraction of less than 35 percent. And uh, again, the ablation group showed uh, an imp a remarkable improvement. And uh, this, in fact, the trial had to be prematurely terminated for efficacy at one year after randomization. The primary endpoint here being a composite of death from any cause, implantation of left ventricle assist device, or urgent heart transplant. And this primary endpoint was driven uh, chiefly by death from any cause or an implantation of uh, LVAD. So I'll skip this for paucity of time, and I'll come straight to conclusion. AF and heart failure commonly occur together. AF adversely affects the prognosis of patients with heart failure. Antiarrhythmic drugs are associated with significant adverse effects. AF ablation on top of guideline directed medical therapy improves clinical outcomes and mortality in heart failure patients, which is a preferred op management option for most patients with heart failure and AF patients, including those with advanced heart failure. So I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Gautam, for a very good discussion on the atrial fibrillation. In fact, you told that uh, first relative contraindication in advanced heart failure, but in the end, this trial which has come, patient waiting for transplant and having very advanced stage, in that there is a benefit. So basically, maybe in some subset of patient, even where the advanced heart failure is there, it can be useful and may delay the, may obviate the need for LVAD and transplant even. So, you know, I'll, uh, I can just, uh, if you, so the thing is that uh, the critics have argued here, so, you know, that, that the, we, we, we don't have the slide, but anyway, the critics argued that, you know, the, uh, end stage heart failure. What those, uh, what the authors were quoting was really not end stage heart failure. Actually, if you go into the depths of the study, they screened 900 patients, and then they randomized 200 patients. So obviously, there's a bias. It's a single center study, in from Germany. So there is a bias, and 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 then uh, uh, interestingly, 30 percent of the patients had paroxysmal atrial, atrial fibrilla fibrillation. So you know that's very strange. And uh, one third of the patients were in NYHA class. So this is advanced heart failure. These are patients who have been referred to this particular center which does heart transplant for heart transplant workup, but they were not necessarily end stage heart failure. So um, probably, but yes, um, this just gives, gives, keeps you open, you know, mentally that uh, even if it's advanced heart failure, you have to keep this option open and you can consider this for an individual patient. Finding in atrial fibrillation that is also giving a new hope. Some of the patients they are having very severe triple vessel disease, left main, proximal LED, or slow flow. Basically, these all arrhythmias, which is where Dr. Bella showed you a very good uh, slide regarding all arrhythmias, we see how they step and uh, roll of self in paradon. And we have seen that slow flow in the majority of the cases. And some of the cases there is coronary artery disease. They published this. I think this is being quoted and cited, this one from abroad, but not from India. And uh, uh, all art this article should be taken, and that will help in further advancement of the knowledge. Very true. If there's uh, ischemic heart disease that's precipitating AF, that's obviously uh, the, the first thing that should be treated. Thank you, Dr. Gautam. I think with this, we close the session. Thanks to all the speakers for such a knowledgeful session. To wrap up this enlightening session, I'd like to request Dr. K. R. Balakrishnan to come up on the stage to present our speakers with Momento. I would like to extend my request to Dr. Satya Mangla Prasad, Dr. Rohit Mathur, Dr. Sandeep Seth, and Dr. Gautam Sharma to come on the stage to receive the memento as a token of appreciation for their insightful and enlightening presentation. First, I would request Dr. K. R. Balakrishnan to present memento to Dr. Rohit Mathur.
Now I'd like to request to, uh, Dr. Balakrishnan to present a memento to Dr. Sandeep Seth. Now I'd request Dr. K.R. Balakrishnan to present a memento to Dr. Gautam Sharma. I request Dr. K.R. Balakrishnan to present mementos to our dais as well. First, I request him to present memento to Dr. Kapil Bhargava. Followed by Dr. Yash Paul Sharma. Now I request him to present Momento to Dr. Pramod Chandolia. And at last, I request him to present a Momento to Dr. Nitish R. Mahapatra. Each presentation has been a beacon of knowledge, shedding light on critical issues, innovative research, and emerging trends in cardiology. Your contribution have not only informed our minds, but have also ignited our passion for excellence in patient care. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as the curtains drop close on the day two of our three-day cardiology conference, and we express our gratitude and admiration for the enriching discussions and insightful presentations. As we bid farewell to this session, let us carry forward the insights gained today and continue to inspire one another in the journey towards advancing cardiovascular health. I also thank all the dignitaries and other audience members for staying with us till now. As we look forward to the final day of our conference, I encourage you to rest and recharge with that, I officially declare the day two of the conference adjourned. Thank you. I request all of you to join us for a gala dinner at the Hotel Marriott.